So welcome everybody. My name is Fern Hames from the Arthur Isler Institute and I'd like to welcome everyone to our third ARI Legacy Seminar. This is part of our series celebrating 50 years of ARI science, so we're all pretty proud of that and it's quite exciting. And of course, so far the series is all online this year because of course of the COVID restrictions, but that hasn't stopped us continuing to celebrate the work of ARI through this series. And through these uh, challenging COVID times, we hope you're all going OK and coping OK in these challenging times. It's good that we can at least get together in this way. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge we are meeting on the unceded traditional lands across the country. I'm on Tungarong country and pay my respects to elders and traditional owners past, present and emerging. Now, today's seminar is particularly special. We're not only celebrating legacy from ARI, but it's also National Science Week. So look out for lots of other events that are on. Um, there's all sorts of things happening virtually online. Jump on the National Science Week website and have a bit of an explore and you'll find lots of things there that are really terrific to do, such as these, um, these seminars. Now there's something else a little unusual about this particular session. It's a legacy seminar, it's a National Science Week seminar, and today all our speakers are women. Now when we reflect on 50 years of ARI science, it's evident that our history, especially our really early decades, um, were dominated by men, as it was in science pretty much everywhere at that time. That's not unusual. And we acknowledge those men did fantastic, impactful work, and men continue to do that at ARI. And we've been celebrating all the stories of science at ARI in this series, and we'll continue to do that. But that was the history. One of the things that's changed in recent years is the role and number of women at ARI. When I think back, you know, the team that I first worked with at ARI in the 80s, it was me, and there was 28 men. But today, 31% of our scientists at ARI are women. And that compares a little favorably with the national average, which has 27% of STEM roles being held by women. But of course, that's still not 50%. So we're still probably not reaching the full human potential of Victoria, Australia, or the scientists who could be contributing to great work. So in this particular session, we want to focus on some of the things which have changed and which will collectively help shape an even brighter future for ARI. And one of those things is improved gender equity at ARI. We continue to seek wide equity inclusion at ARI, not just in gender, but across cultures, abilities, socioeconomic status, of course. And today, although we could choose from a large number of great presenters at ARI, just for this session today, we're focusing on stories of change from some of the terrific ARI women. So Josephine, Tracy, Paulo and Anique are going to tell us about changes in decision making, collaboration, skills and innovation with stories ranging right across grasslands, fire and fishes. So Josephine, over to you. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Josephine May Hunter and it's such a pleasure to be here today with you all. Thanks so much to you Fern, Kim and Andy Geschke for inviting me to present to be part of today's ARI Legacy Seminar. I'd also like to thank all my colleagues at ARI who make being at work such an absolute pleasure. I uh, arrived at ARI over a decade ago and it was readily apparent ARI was a special place that comprised incredibly talented, passionate and a dedicated team with staff working around the clock seven days a week to apply their expertise in support of better biodiversity outcomes. Two important qualities that make ARI special is, it, is that it's both enduring and our research directly makes a difference in supporting policy and land management decisions. ARI is the only research institute of its kind left in Australia and this has yielded long-term view of uh, data and extensive ecological knowledge, which has been built over decades. Our research can make a difference and have impact because it's underpinned by this extensive ecological knowledge. And we've also aligned our research to inform policy and decision making. We've developed decision support tools, novel survey methods and analysis tools, provided new conceptual knowledge 
and house a unique combination of skill sets which together makes ARI well positioned to provide ecological advice and undertake complex and relevant analyses. These attributes of ARI are critical in supporting meaningful uptake of science both now and into the future. What makes ARI unique and enduring is underpinned by some critical enablers that support us to generate science that matters. Over the past 50 years, ARI has recruited a huge diversity of staff and skill sets, and we continue to build capability through training across emerging tools, techniques and approaches. And this strategy has been supporting the credibility and reputation of staff to undertake applied biodiversity research that's both rigorous and relevant. We're increasingly focusing on communication and dissemination of our work through different formats so we can connect with different audiences through presentations at our local primary school, being interviewed on TV or radio, providing advice to the minister or presenting at international conferences, along with more traditional comms through scientific reports and papers, but also breaking the mold and entering into social media platforms. What stands out is that ARI has an ongoing commitment to engagement, working collaboratively across agencies, universities, both in Victoria and interstate, with the Commonwealth Government, as well as international collaborations in China, the USA, Finland, the remote regions of Mongolia. We undertake extensive community engagement with citizen scientists to support people connecting with and valuing nature. ARI is responsive to changes in society. For example, how we think about conservation science has changed over the years, and we're adapting our research by beginning new adventures in behaviour change science and ways of knowing country through the co-appointment of two new postdocs. Today, we're going to share some examples of how we're undertaking science that matters through the upcoming presentations from Tracy Hollow and Anique, who will show, showcase three areas of research that we anticipate will be important for our future work. Tracy is going to talk about how decision sciences are proving increasingly useful given the complexity of environmental problems. Hollow is going to provide a great example of how we are closing the loop to demonstrate genuine adaptive management in the most threatened vegetation type in Victoria. And then we'll hear from Anique, who'll describe ARI's capability to integrate multiple long-term aquatic data sets and apply innovative research approaches to reveal the hidden signature of ear bone chemistry so we can better understand fish recruitment. And then I'll close with some thoughts about how the role of ARI scientists is changing before we open up for your questions. Over to you, Tracy. Uh, the work I'm presenting today is not an individual effort. I'm fortunate to work with very talented people with a broad set of skills so we can tackle the complexity of the environmental problems that we're faced with. It's worth reminding ourselves that as applied ecologists, we have a pretty hard job. And I think this quote by Bob May captures it perfectly. Ecology is not rocket science, it's much harder. Ecological systems are hugely complex, often with limited information to understand it. And actually, as applied ecologists, our job's even harder. We not only aim to understand ecological systems, we also aim to understand how best to manage them within the constraints of competing values and limited funds. So I reckon these guys had it pretty easy, and I bet they never had to worry about the tight budgets or tight pants by the look of this photo. So let's unpack this complexity a little bit more. While complexity of managing ecological systems has always existed, in the past we've tended to simplify the problem and focus on one or more high-valued species or specific taxon groups. As our knowledge has evolved over time, there's been a change in emphasis to managing entire systems. And this has brought a recognition that spatial context matters and the importance of temporal and spatial dynamics. As the impacts of climate change are realised, there's a recognition the past is not necessarily a good indicator of the future, the past benchmarks may not be relevant, and we need to rethink our approach to managing the environment into the future. In order to achieve good outcomes, we need to better understand the benefits of actions for different species and how management benefits vary in time and space. To complicate things further, we recognise we can't manage the environment in a vacuum and there are other values that are often competing. 
There's also a growing acceptance that to get good outcomes for the environment, we need to shift our approach to place a community at the centre, focus on valuing nature and respectfully recognising traditional owner values and knowledge. And this is all within the very tight constraint of limited funding. So navigating this complexity can be paralyzing and trying to understand it and plan it out can sometimes end up looking like this. And this is my favorite Looney cartoon and it perfectly depicts many of the brainstorming sessions trying to nut out a problem. So one area we're focusing on at ARI for navigating complex problems is decision science. This is a multidisciplinary field that focuses on making optimal choices based on available information. It seeks to clearly understand the value judgments and scientific components underpinning decision making and identify any trade-offs that might be required. One technique we're focusing on is structured decision making, a decision science framework that helps to navigate complexity by disaggregating the problem into the various components, dealing with each component separately and then recombining to come to a decision. One of the qualities of this framework is that it's value focused, so what we care about. And these are discussed upfront and then translated into objectives. Then the evidence to evaluate alternative actions is considered in subsequent steps. This process is typically iterative and adaptive, whereby future decisions improve over time as we gain more knowledge. Although I will say that it can also be used for one-off decision making. The most important step of this process is the first one, and that is defining the problem and the context of the decision. And in my experience, I don't think we actually spend enough time really trying to understand the problem. What do people want? What's the scope? What are the sticking points? Why have attempts in the, in the past failed? And I love this Einstein quote that really captures this point. If we spend more time really trying to understand the problem, then the solution is often quite straightforward. One example of this was some work we did on incorporating ecological values as part of strategic bushfire management plans. At the onset of this project, the specification was to bring together disparate ecological data sets so they could be used to inform bushfire management plans alongside life and property considerations. So they wanted more data. However, as we worked with fire planners to better understand the problem and what the sticking points were, it became clear that what they needed was a decision framework to better navigate the problem and to understand the decision context with which available data and models could be used. As part of this process, we were able to articulate what a good outcome looks like and elicit a number of fundamental objectives that people cared about, ranging from ecosystems, iconic landscapes and species. And this is an example of one of those. This process highlighted that some objectives and associated performance measures were vague and could not be directly measured. For example, an EPPC requirement is to minimise the impact of fuel reduction burning on a listed species through an evaluation of the likelihood of a significant impact. The terms likelihood and significant impact are vague terms and relate to value judgments and risk tolerance. So this highlighted another need that research could contribute to. We developed a structured process to elicit value judgments on the level of impact that constitutes a significant impact, as well as the tolerance people have to the uncertainty in the estimate of that impact or the likelihood. For this process, we were able to derive quantitative measurable decision rules for these vague terms. And it turned out that the resulting rules differed depending on the current conservation status of the species. So we were also able to provide more nuance on what we mean by a significant impact. The focus of defining the problem and developing a decision framework that incorporated clear measurable objectives now enabled a more streamlined process for achieving the wants, that is the data. So we, it was actually Neville Amos, developed a tool that integrates ecological data sets sensibly, but also fit for purpose. And this was summarised in a user interface called the Fire Analysis Module for Ecological Values, or FAME for short.
So this tool allows end users to explore and evaluate the consequences of alternative management scenarios for fuel reduction burning, where the measures relate directly to the objectives and the values they care about. Another part of the decision problem we typically don't focus on, especially as researchers, is how we navigate trade-offs. But I think we can add value in this space. In the Melbourne Strategic Assessment Program, decisions requiring management are required for multiple threatened species and ecological communities, often with overlapping distributions and different preferred management options with respect to fire and weed management. So we applied a technique called swing weighting, which systematically elicits value preferences. This research highlighted that while in principle we care about all threatened species and communities, our value preferences depend on the decision context and the expected outcomes of actions within that context. The benefit of this approach is that it enables better consideration of all relevant values, which can be really difficult when making trade-offs intuitively. But it also enables better transparency for trade-offs and a clearer communication of the rationale for decisions. I haven't talked about the final step of the decision cycle on adaptive management. I'll leave that to Horlow, who's speaking next specifically on that topic. But in summary, when putting this talk together, it's given me an opportunity to reflect on my role as a science, scientist and how it's changed over time. Before I worked at ARI, my research predominantly focused on number crunching. I was an ecological modeler and I developed decision support tools with the hope that one day someone would use them. Um, it's not since I started working in the department that I realised the importance of that first step of defining the problem, which has meant for me stepping away from the computer, I mean, metaphorically speaking um, at the moment, but engaging with people more, trying to understand the problem better and creating a shared understanding of the problem. So the research is not only fit for purpose, but used appropriately. And lastly, I think the decision sciences have a big role to play in how we tackle diff difficult environmental problems. And research can add value to each of the components of the decision-making process. It really helps us to navigate the complexity we now need to consider in decision-making. It helps us to identify the impediments to decision-making so that they can be addressed appropriately. And if problems are well-defined and our research fit for purpose, this will lead to better uptake and appropriate use of science. The process is, promotes transparency, which leads to better accountability. And lastly, it's evidence-based, which is critical for improved outcomes for biodiversity. Thank you. I'll now hand over to Horla, who'll talk about adaptive management. Hello everyone, I'm Horla. Um, I'm presenting today on how ARI is using adaptive management in its true sense to help manage critically endangered natural temperate grassland ecological community. Today I'll be talking about the Melbourne Strategic Assessment as an example of adaptive management. If you recall the decision science wheel from Tracy's talk, the adaptive management is the last slice of the wheel. Adaptive management is the concept of learning as you go and incorporating the new learnings into your strategies. I'll then give an overview of the grassland model as a decision support tool in the context of the adaptive management. I'm representing the work of an incredibly talented and committed team of people. The team's led by Steve Sinclair and the work is funded by the Melbourne Strategic Assessment Ecological Program. So what are we doing that sets this piece of work apart from all the other tools that are out there? Traditionally, when scientists, managers and policymakers use adaptive management, the crucial step to update the existing knowledge with fresh data is often omitted. So then the adaptive management uh, chain is broken. Um, and because of that, decision context isn't updated and that makes the rest of the state steps in the wheel obsolete. To overcome this problem, we use the adaptive management um, and we set up the model to be updated with annual monitoring data and we use 
um, with test management scenarios with field data. I'll talk about the importance of that later in the talk. The model prediction is over a 50 year time frame, which is quite unique in itself. We also formally acknowledge uncertainty. So for those of you who are not familiar with the Melbourne Strategic Assessment, it's the Commonwealth Government's commitment to offset the impact of urban growth around Melbourne. This, has, um, uh, this program has many components, but today I'll only be talking about the natural temperate grassland, which is the ecological community that makes the Western Grassland Reserve. There's going to be about 15,000 hectares of grassland to be um, protected at the end of this program. Personally, I'm a big fan of grassland, not because I fetishize its endangered status, but because I enjoy its subtleties. You really have to peel your eyes to see its understated beauty. So to give you some context of the importance and urgency of conserving natural temperate grassland, here's a map of its original extent in mustard yellow. Um, it used to cover the big plain stretching from the western suburbs, today's western suburbs, all the way to the west of the state, state's border. And that's what we've got left today, uh, which is less than 1% of its original extent. It contains um, 25 nationally threatened flora and fauna, um, and the Western Grassland Reserve is marked in red here just west of Melbourne. So the MSA is a contentious space. There's a lot of anger and antagonistic attitude from the public. And there's a lot of pressure from conservation scientists. So the stakes are high for this program. Uh, we have the pressure to do the right thing to conserve one of Victoria's most threatened ecological communities, if not the most threatened one. Um, then we have the pressure from conservation scientists community. We have um, very angry people and of course the government is accountable for every action we take. And this adds up to um, the necessity for a sound decision tool to conserve natural temperate grassland. So now I'll give you an overview of the grassland model. The aim here is to test management scenarios explicitly um, with field data. The importance of doing that is so that we have zero ambiguity about the effects of management scenarios on the condition of natural temperate grassland. This way you can, you can quantify the change. Um, each action takes the results on the overall quality of the community. But this will only work with field data. By updating the model with field data to test management scenarios, we can do adaptive management in its true essence. So now we have um, the model components. Um, how is it put together? We've included four broad um, categories of variable types. So the first one is lifeform variables. And we have a range of climatic variables, um, management variables, and at last, soil chemical variables. We have overall around 30 odd variables in this model. Having sort of a, a really comprehensive range of variables is great and all, but it has its downside to it, in the sense that it creates an insatiable ap appetite for data for this model to run much like a cookie monster. To overcome this, we've come up with a range of ways to fill the gap. Uh, we start with our annual monitoring data. We've um, called on the help of grassland experts. We've formally elicited data from experts via a series of expert workshops. We've also bulked up the model um, with machine generated data that's both random but realistic in the modeling space. So the model um, outputs um, cover predictions of 13 life form variables. These are then used to produce a grassland quality score on y-axis 
of the next 50 years time frame on X axis. The continuous weekly lines are the grassland quality trajectories over the time frame, and the dashed lines are the uncertainty bounds. As you can see, the uncertainty bounds are quite wide at this stage, but as we update the model with more data, both field and experts, it will start to look much better and narrower. And of course, the um, quality trajectory lines will change every time we update the model. And like every model, um, it can't do everything. We have the prediction error here uh, uh, on the model on the observed and predicted values on X and Y axis respectively. You can see the model predicts um, better for thermometer cover, for example, where the points are closer to the AB line, whilst for background, the prediction's um, a bit all over the place at this stage. So we're working to um, make it better. We're also planning to um, incorporate uh, management costs to the model. This will help the trade-off between monetary costs and ecological benefits and how these two things interplay over the uh, course of 50 years time. We're also going to incorporate um, a more detailed model, weed model, as well as um, doing a long-term test against expert data. So all in all, Emmett, uh, Melbourne Strategic, strategic Assessment uh, grassland model is a, is a great example of how AORI is closing the adaptive management loop. We've created a decision tool that's updated every year, so we're up to date with the environmental and the climatic changes that we're facing when we strategize for the highly contentious and impactful program. By incorporating costs to complement our ecological understanding, we make our research more applied and readily available to decision makers. Thanks everyone for listening. I'll hand over to Anik now. Thank you, Holo. Some really important work on our valuable grasslands there. Hi all, I'm Anik. Happy Science Week. Um, I'm part of the Applied Aquatic Ecology team at ARI and going with the future vision of this seminar, I'd like to share with you some insight into ARI's research through integration and innovation. So let's start with a map which illustrates a number of waterways across Victoria that have been subject to annual population monitoring by ARI, some for as long as 14 and 24 years. Now, this is just a snapshot of some of our aquatic ecology monitoring programs to highlight the span of data sets which ARI, due to its size, history, staff and collaborations, have been able to collate. The programs here have varying objectives and funding sources, some federal, some state. So if you start here in 1997, the Murray River downstream of Yarrawonga monitoring program here shown in purple has been running now for 24 years. Since 2006, ARI have conducted monitoring of Macquarie perch in the Broken Golden catchment here in green, and that is the longest term data set on the species in the catchment. So the ovens highlighted in light green has been monitored consistently since 2007 for various programs. Also beginning in 2007 is the Victorian Environmental Flows Monitoring and Assessment Program, which has collected data from waterways highlighted in red across the state there, and that's now been running for 14 years. Uh, finally, the Native Fish Monitoring Program in both the Midamida River here in blue and the 10 waterways highlighted in orange provided ARI with a nice range of additional data across Victoria. So as you can see this, from just this snapshot of aquatic ecology programs, ARI have quite an impressive collection of data sets across the state over time, which provides unique opportunities to apply this innovative research approach. While programs like these have been standalone successes, ARI recognises the value of these data sets and samples, and we aim to maximise their use by combining them to produce a range of outputs relating to theoretical and applied ecology to answer questions for a range of stakeholders and beyond. I've chosen some recent work of ARIs to present as a case study to show our innovative research through the unique integration of multiple data sets. So in this case study, we used the relatively novel approach of microchemistry to assign birth origin to juvenile Murray cod through the analysis of their ear bones, which are called otoliths. 
Now I'll go into the hows and whys of differentiating wild spawn fish from stock fingling shortly, but first let's have a quick look at the range of programs from which we were able to collate samples of juvenile Murray cod to achieve these neat findings. So samples were collected from five Victorian waterways, combining four programs with varying and objectives funded by a number of different stakeholders. So in the red here, we have the long-term intervention monitoring program, which was funded by the Commonwealth Environmental Water Office. In green, we have the Environmental Flows uh, Program, which is funded by DELP. In blue, we have the uh, Monitoring Program of Murray Cod, which is funded by the Murray-Darling Basin Authorities. And in yellow, we have the Native Fishery Court Cards Program, funded by the Victorian Fisheries Authorities and DELP. Also, the Fisheries Authorities provided some really important stocking data for these four hatcheries in purple, as well as the fingerlings which we're able to use for our study. The objectives of this particular study were to answer natural recruitment questions for river managers relating to management interventions such as flow and habitat restoration, as well as to provide support to the Victorian Fisheries Authorities relating to the evaluation of their stocking outcomes. So why the need to differentiate wild spawn fish from stocked fingerlings? Let's start with the problem. Uh, modifiers to our waterways are presented in a number of ways. So the box on the left here details these as modification, habitat alteration, barriers, exotic species, and there are a few others, but each of these can impact the life history processes of fish such as spawning and recruitment and ultimately their population outcomes such as abundance. River managers and fishery authorities are working on these management interventions and a shared goal by many of these is to boost fish, fish recruitment. So ARI recognised that there was a limited ability for the evaluation of recruitment outcomes relating to waterway restorations and fish stocking management interventions. Now this is where the relatively novel approach of microchemistry to assign birth origin by identifying stocked and wild spawn recruits becomes a valuable tool. Now with the aim to provide answers into differentiating stocked fish from wild spawn fish, and help provide support in better evaluating outcomes such as management intervention aimed at boosting recruitment. This study used microchemistry performed on the ear bone, which is called the otolith of Murray Cod. Now I've provided a, an image here which shows you a transverse section of the ear bone of a juvenile Murray Cod. So ear bones are commonly used to age fish using much the same method as aging a tree by cutting a cross section and counting the rings which are laid down each year. Uh, this particular fish is a young of year, so it's less than a year old and it doesn't yet have any annual rings to count. Murray cod used for birth origin analysis in this study were collected from the five Victorian waterways I pointed out earlier, which have been stocked from hatcheries and subsamples of these cod were also collected from all the hatcheries which sourced the stocking and fingerlings. Ear bones are used to determine birth origin because trace elements from the aquatic environment are deposited in the ear bone throughout the fish's lifetime which creates a chronological record of the environment experienced by the fish. So the core of the ear bone here would represent the natal period and the edge would represent the most recent period. And values of uh, the ear bone edge from waterway fish and the ear bone core of hatchery fish provided unique signatures, which were used as location markers for each of the waterways and hatcheries, which is essentially a result of the unique catchment geology of each location. So by taking a sample of the ear bone core of fish collected from the waterways, we were able to identify their birth origin as either wild spawned from their place of capture or stocked from a hatchery, depending on whether the core signature was more closely matched with the signature of the waterway from which the fish was captured or the hatchery which stocked fish into that waterway. So overall, microchemistry performed on the ear bones of Murray Cod proved an effective method to identify stocked and wild spawned fish, which gave ARI the capability to provide information to support river managers in understanding waterway restoration measures such as environmental flow and habitat interventions aimed at enhancing natural recruitment. We we're also able to provide the much needed information to fisheries authorities relating to their current large investment in stocking. So you have limited resources such as fingerlings. It makes sense to stock fish into waterways which give the highest return, which would be the highest representation of stocked fish. So helping to disentangle the role of natural recruitment and stocking, this work has further enabled 
ARI better interpretation and outcomes for a number of studies currently underway. And there aren't many agencies that have the capacity to integrate these kinds of programs, which allows ARI to use such novel evaluation approaches. Um, collecting and combining multiple data sets that encompass such broad spatial and temporal scales within the state has provided us with the opportunity to produce some really valuable findings. So I'll wrap up with a series of ARI papers answering different objectives through specific regions in Victoria over time which to produce a range of outputs relating to theoretical and applied ecology, as well as the methods that we've used to do this. So here we've assessed 25 years of trout cod recovery actions, habitat work, growth and recruitment dynamics, uh, genetics from samples we've collected over time, methods flow work and more recent, the novel evaluation approaches. The list could go on, but I think it's time for me to pass back to Josephine. So finally, I'd just like to acknowledge and give a big thanks to the team at ARI for their hard work that went towards producing these outcomes. And thank you all for your time. Over to Josephine. Thanks so much, Anique. It's so interesting to hear about this innovative research to help us understand uh, fish recruitment better. ARI has had a history of collaboration with policy, land managers, the community and researchers. And these collaborations ensure that our science is informed by the needs of stakeholders, whilst also supporting appropriate and meaningful application and interpretation of the science that we produce. And then it described the added benefits of these collaborations in drawing together data sets from a diverse group of agencies to generate new insights that could not have been achieved from individual studies on their own. To meet the challenges of the future, we're further broadening our skill base. We're reinvesting in our own science capability through further training and innovation. And this is helping us to develop new tools and survey methods, for example, new tagging methods to enable real-time data collection so we can better understand large-scale migration patterns of eels and fish. I mentioned earlier that we continue to recruit new skill sets through the co-appointment of postdocs in behaviour change science and ways of knowing country. We've also recruited expertise in environmental DNA survey techniques. These revolutionary survey methods take advantage of the genetic material that aquatic animals shed in the environment and has great potential to detect species that are otherwise difficult to find. We're developing communities of practice, for instance, in decision analysis, working side by side with policy staff and practitioners to further embed the practice and principles of evidence-based decision making to support better biodiversity outcomes. Casting our gaze to the future, it remains crucial that long-term biodiversity data collection continues to be a core part of our work as scientists. Although for now, like many professions under COVID lockdown, we're current, currently restricted to working from home. But we hope to be back in the bush before too long because on-ground data collection by field ecologists is vital to fill knowledge gaps as part of genuine adaptive management, as well as for validating expert opinion about the effectiveness of management interventions. And while ecological, an ecological knowledge base will always underpin our work, it now routinely integrates technologies such as remote sensing, machine learning and infrared cameras to produce new representations of species distributions and abundances, along with models of relevant ecological processes such as fire and flow regimes. So high quality field data and sophisticated modelling in combination with expert ecological knowledge come together to foster the development of meaningful decision support tools to help land managers make informed decisions. As we move forward, it's worth acknowledging our role is changing. We're also making increasing use of decision analysis tools, which Tracy described in her talk. These tools are valuable for problem framing to help us scope research in a meaningful and relevant way, as well as to develop clear objectives for the values we really care about to ensure ecological models can be integrated with real world decision making. There's also an increasing desire for scenario or what if analyses from within government and the broader community so we can predict the consequences of management interventions across time and space from local to national scales. 
So the development of decision support tools such as FAME that Tracy described and the native temperate grassland model that Hallow described will become even more valuable in forecasting what the future might look like whilst also factoring in the impacts of climate change. Decision tools provide an open and transparent method for dealing with the increasing complexity that is inherent in balancing the competing environmental, social and economic outcomes, which is vital when there's high levels of public scrutiny, such as for the creation of the Western Grassland Reserve that Hallow described. So while there's no escaping, there's many challenges ahead, including a great deal of uncertainty. I see a bright future as possible, and I'm super excited to be part of the broader team that is tackling these hard problems and contribute ecological knowledge to where it's needed most to encourage better outcomes for biodiversity. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining us today. Happy Science Week to you all. And now back to you, Fern. Thank you so much, Josephine. Um, just a terrific summary there, and it makes me certainly proud of all of the work that ARA does and, and excited about the future. Um, I think we may have some questions, and I suspect that Andy might be able to um, share some of those with us. Is that right, Andy? Uh, it's, it's not quite yet, because I haven't actually got any questions in. Um, so those who are sitting at the keyboard, please feel free to submit some questions for us to pass over to our lovely presenters. They did an awesome job and I think that was just an amazing effort by everybody. Um, Absolutely. Great. So while, while people are um, putting in their questions, I'm just going to go, bravo, thank you, everybody. <laughs> everybody clap all around the country. Um, thank you to each of you. That was terrific. And, um, and I acknowledge it's a... Um, it's a strange kind of format to be doing a seminar, but we're all kind of getting used to these things now, right? Um, do any of you have questions for each other? Or well, while you're thinking about that, I could give a little bit of a um, plug for the next one while we're thinking about it. So I do want to thank you all and recognise that our future is indeed bright. And just while people are thinking about it, we should mention that if you missed part of today's session or want to share it with others, the recording of this session will be available on the ARI website soon as we put all of the recordings of our um, legacy seminars, or most of them. And the next legacy seminar, which is number four, will be on August the 31st, which is not that far away, same time, 1 to 2 p.m., and we'll be hearing from Peter Menkhorst, who many of you will know, our absolute legend, who'll be talking about ARI's early years of mammal research. So um, look out for the invite for that one, sign up for it and join us then as well. But um, I'll go back to Andy and see yep. if he has discovered any questions. Go for it, Andy. We do. We've got two more in. Um, the first one is actually really relevant to the current situation and it's asking what kind of work can you do during lockdown? And I think this actually might stem over the two different restriction stages. So maybe Hollow or Anik, um, with your field work, how have things changed with the, uh, I guess, lockdown three and four restrictions being slightly different? Um, for me personally, the first wave, so stage three, we were able to perform field work within um, quite quite strict and responsible COVID restrictions. So um, a lot of my work is in remote areas um, in the northern rivers of Victoria. And so we would camp, um, which limits our contact with regional people. Uh, we could stay in Airbnbs, but yeah, I think we just, um, this, this time around, everything um, has been put on hold. So... Yeah, um, uh, for Melbourne Strategic Assessment, um, we unfortunately are um, not going to go out this spring to collect um, our annual monitoring data, which is a shame because um, we'll uh, miss a step in the model. And that's the decision that um, uh, people in town, um, the ecological program has made. So. Um, which makes sense, um, given it's in urban growth area and um, getting a lot of public attention to um, people working outside. So um, 
um, yeah, the department wants to lead by example by um, not um, having lots of movements around. Yeah. Um, another question I can open up to anyone is where do you see ARI in 10 years? I'm going to send it to you, Josephine. You look like <laughs> you're really keen for it. <laughs> oh, I think, you know, um, many things will be similar to what we're doing now and, you know, some of the changes that we talked about incorporating, you know, different different technologies will also uh, be present. Um, I think that if we look back over our history, we're, we're still underpinned by, you know, collecting fundamental ecological data and I think we'll continue to be doing that. But we'll also be taking the best of um, novel survey methods that uh, have been developed in the Institute and through collaborations with our partners and, and, uh, and other community uh, members as well. Yeah, great. Um, this one's for ARI in general as well around how we're incorporating traditional Indigenous knowledge into our research. Um, Fern or Kim, it might be a better position for you guys to answer, but if any of the presenters would like to answer on it, I'm more than happy for you. I'm happy to start with that, Andy, if you like. It's firm yeah. here. Um, I think this is one of the uh, most important and terrific things that we are evolving really effectively at ARI. People who've been involved with ARI will know that for a long time we've been striving to work with traditional owners and Aboriginal corporations in a range of our different projects across the state. For example, we have a long running program in which we've worked on turtles with Yorta Yorta up at Barma. We've worked um, on and off a bit with Gundajmara with Tupong and, and eels and other species down near um, Bajbim. So there are examples amongst our work where we have really strived to work alongside traditional owners and integrate um, two ways of knowing, if you like, into the things that we understand about place and how systems are operating. But um, it has been probably a bit ad hoc and we recognise that now is the opportunity to evolve that way in which we work in that space and that it is becoming increasingly of interest to a wide range of researchers and the community and traditional owners and their groups as well. So one of the things that I think Josephine might have made um, mention of was that we do have our new postdoc starting at ARI soon, whose particular role will be looking at how do we integrate multiple ways of knowing? How do we bring together Western science, traditional ecological science, cultural um, realms? How, how do we bring those things together in a way that is meaningful for all and actually works in a transdisciplinary way in that it brings us to a new way of knowing and understanding place and our reciprocal responsibilities in how we look after place into the future. So I think that is a particularly exciting part of the future for ARI and um, I guess watch this space as it's something that um, we intend to integrate wherever it is relevant and possible uh, in the work that we do. But other, if others want to add to that, please go ahead. Uh, I'm not seeing any heads, heads nodding on that, so I might move on to the next question. Thanks, Fern. Um, two questions around the grasslands it is indeed bringing up more interest. Um, how do we convey the importance of Victoria's grasslands to the public? It's hard when people just see a lot of grass. And the second question is, um, how is the annual monitoring program progressing? So, Holo, I might send that to you. Um, I, I'll start with the latter. So, the annual monitoring program um, started from 2013 or thereabouts, um, and it's been going every year. But due to COVID this year, 2021 season, um, we may not be able to go and collect um, data. Um, for the first question, but it will keep going, of course, after everything is opened up and um, back to normal, or if there is such a thing um, anymore. Um, but going back to the grassland question, it's a, it's an excellent question I, and often bugs me. 
how to pick, make, make people excited about grassland. Um, um, and like I said, you know, you really have to, it's a very subtle and understated um, landscape. So it's hard enough to um, get ec ecologists excited about it, yet alone the general public. But um, if we take the approach of um, uh, leading through um, examples of um, learning and um, the value of uh, grasslands uh, to people uh, when it has the scope of becoming available to the public um, in the future. So that might make it more accessible to people to understand its importance and um, how threatened it is and what, what um, how Indigenous people may have used it, um, used this landscape um, in the past, etc. Those sorts of um, information and communication would help, um, I think, get people excited about it. Awesome. Thank you, Ola. Um, last question I've got on the list. So if there are other ones, still feel free to submit them. Um, this one I might send to you, Tracy, and it's around collaborations. So the question is, do you collaborate with all uh, at all with ecological consultants in Victoria? And I might expand it to include who are our main sort of collaborations with in your work at least? Yeah, I mean, we routinely um, collaborate with consultants. Um, I mean, we try to uh, engage with people that have the expertise that are that are relevant for the particular projects that we're working on. Um, some of the projects that I've been involved in that has had extensive input from consultants has been through the um, the strategic management prospects, understanding um, benefits of different types of management, particularly in the waterway space, um, various consult consultants who have expertise in um, wetlands and um, waterways um, through Melbourne Strategic Assessment as well. So, um, yeah, so I think it's, yeah, we do. We, we, we don't sort of sit back and um, we're we're very we're very collaborative with consultants and people within universities as well and other partner organisations through um, of DELPS. Yeah, great. Uh, Fern, did you have anything you wanted to add, or sh should we wrap it up? I'm just happy to say, Andy, uh, just to repeat our thanks to all of the speakers and to you. Um, it's been a really terrific session. I've really enjoyed it and. Indeed, uh, just say it again, our ARI future is definitely bright and um, lots of challenges ahead, of course, but we will continue to be responsive to those and I think today's session has helped us recognise how we will do that. So um, thank you to all the speakers and all the people who've contributed to the programs that we've heard about today. Um, don't forget, number four in the Legacy Series is Peter Menkost on August the 31st, 1 to 2pm. Hope to see you again then. Take care, everyone, in these troubling times. Thanks so much for joining in and do have a really terrific, wonderful National Science Week. Thanks, everybody. See you later.